So it's it's a, a real pleasure to to have Ron Baghetto, who is a, a very dear colleague of mine and uh, of ours in the in the creativity community. Um, Ron is now based in at Arizona State University. He recently moved from University of Connecticut, and he will come to Geneva just next year. Uh, and it's, it's quite poetic that I think Ron, this was the exact time when you <laughs> you were supposed to start talking in Geneva. And um, Ron worked on a variety of topics, many of them related to education and creativity, but uh, a, a variety of topics within that. I mean, from from uh, creative expression to beliefs and identity and, and uh, self-efficacy and uh, creative learning. So uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to have him talk about a new topic in a way, but not so new, I think. I think it connects with many of the things you've been working on, Ron. Uncertainty and creativity in times of crisis. And um, following this, Wendy and I will have uh, a few questions and then we're gonna open up to the public. So Ron, without further ado, I'm gonna let you, I'm gonna stop sharing and let you share anything if you have a <laughs> PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Vlad, and thank you, Wendy, for um, co-hosting this particular session. And thank you, everyone, for joining us um, this evening. If it's that time in, in your part of the world, it's um, early morning here in the sunny state of Arizona. <laughs> and so it's a thrill to talk about, you know, somewhat of a difficult topic that we're all certainly experiencing. And so the idea here is to really explore this concept of um, creativity under uncertainty. Now, can you see my screen? Is that viewable? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. So um, what I'd like to kind of talk about, and this is a little visual play on words, I put creativity under uncertainty here, because <laughs> the focus really is going to be on uncertainty and exploring um, what this kind of phenomena is and how this has been kind of conceptualized and then moving into um, exploring what this means for creative expression, um, for new ways of thinking and acting, and even, you know, just kind of our awareness or even our own existential awareness, if you will. So I also put this little um, bit.ly um, link down here where you can link to a version, uh, I'm going to drop it in the chat if I can here as well, where you can link to a accepted, uncorrected version of a paper that I'm kind of basing these ideas on that's a contribution to Vlad's Encyclopedia of the Possible. So if you want to kind of explore that paper later on, and I'm certainly, uh, I'll drop my email in there as well. I'd love to hear from folks, your thoughts, um, disagreements. <laughs> differences, um, agreements. I think, you know, anything that you would like to kind of share and keep this conversation going. But let's kind of dive into this kind of idea. So I think there's general consensus in, in the idea that uncertainty represents a state of doubt. Um, and the way it's kind of been conceptualized um, by scholars, but I think also, you know, the way we kind of think about it in almost in everyday life, kind of ranges on a continuum, if you will. Um, so it's not really, these aren't fixed categories. And I think depending on what kind of uncertainty we're experiencing, we might find ourselves at different points on this continuum. But if you can see the way that kind of represented it here, at one kind of extreme anchor, um, uncertainty sometimes is conceptualized and even um, felt as something that should be eliminated because it's very uncomfortable. Um, it can be a signifier of kind of impending doom or chaos or, or great harm. So at one end of the continuum, it's conceptualized as, a, as something that needs to be eliminated or potentially avoided, uh, proactively avoided, or even if we do experience it, let's quickly resolve it. And then as we kind of move towards the other end of the continuum, um, uncertainty can be conceptualized as something that can be engaged with and actually sustained and even perhaps more radical than that, invited into our experiences and into our life. And so on that left side, kind of the eliminated anchored side, we see uh, a body of scholarship that looks at things such as, you know, strategic uncertainty management or strategic risk management, those kinds of conceptions um, where it's, you know, the effort is, I think, and, you know, there's a more nuanced view even in that kind of line of scholarship where the idea is, you know, even though we may not be able to completely eliminate it, perhaps we could mitigate it, we can anticipate it, we can at least quickly resolve it. But again, it's still seen as um, kind of this potentially harmful irritant, if you will. And there's an interest I talk about in the paper, there's a, I love this quote by Reith that describes, you know, 
this end of the continuum as kind of this optimistic enlightenment belief um, in the possibility of eliminating uncertainties of the future through kind of rational action in the present. So that's the whole idea that if we think rationally now, if, if we're strategic, if we plan well enough, then we can avoid all these things. And you hear this in, in kind of the rhetoric that's going around even with respect to COVID and all the other kinds of um, tumultuous uncertainties that we're facing in the world today. On the other end of the continuum then is a set of thinkers, and this is where I'm gonna position myself and um, kind of my talk today and certainly the paper, where you see uncertainty as being conceptualized in a very different way. Um, a lot of the uh, early American pragmatists, um, John Dewey, and even before Dewey, and I think probably the most kind of um, clear, but sometimes difficult to understand <laughs> thinker on this was Charles Sanders Peirce, who I think influenced Dewey and James's ideas, William James's ideas on uncertainty and doubt and the way doubt serves as a kind of a motivator for new thought and action. <laughs> and what moves us into a new state of reason that which he called abductive reasoning. But Dewey talked kind of beautifully about um, the idea of sustaining our desire to kind of prematurely close our experiences with uncertainty and doubt and how doubt really is kind of a gateway to inquiry. All inquiry starts in doubt. And even, you know, some of the thinkers and scholars and the Car Cartesian scholars kind of read Descartes' work as suggesting, you know, that doubt is kind of primary to even our kind of existential awareness. And, you know, the, the famous kind of little um, slogan is cogito ergo sum, you know, I think therefore I am. But some thinkers have said it's actually doubt precedes that. Doubt is primary. So it's really dubito and then perhaps cogito ergo sum. That, so it's in doubt that we kind of are moved to this state of kind of awareness and thinking and then kind of our existential, our existential awareness of self. So that's kind of where I'm going to position myself. Let's explore that a little bit. And I'll give you some of my assumptions that I'm operating with. And I just want to give us a couple of anchor thoughts because I really want us to move into questions and then discussion within this, this discussion room and, and exploring these ideas. So my kind of operating assumptions and assertions start with this idea then that uncertainty can serve as a gateway or an opening to new possibilities for thought and action. And that uncertainty the why this happens is because uncertainty disrupts our routines and habits, and it serves as a signifier that new ways of thinking and acting are not only possible, but necessary. And finally, that uncertainty can serve as kind of a catalyst and condition for creative thought and action. So that if we're really wanting to think about creativity, you know, what, what is the kind of the mode of what moves us into that space, I would argue is uncertainty. And what sustains us in that space, I would again argue, is uncertainty. And so, before we move further with this, I, I want to say that we don't always need to think and act in, in different ways. Um, if we want to move from A to B and we know how to do that, or there is a way to do that that's very efficient and effective, then by all means, you know, uh, let's move towards that. So in what states do we need um, to kind of think and act in new ways? And I would argue that's when we encounter uncertainty. Um, when we have when we have this kind of routine or procedure A to B, and we encounter this kind of impasse, and it kind of and, and Peirce's beautiful idea behind this is a state of genuine doubt. So this is not kind of paper doubts, but genuine doubt where we really don't know how to move forward, where it has really troubled our thinking. So it's in those spaces where um, Peirce would argue our 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 formal inductive and deductive forms of reasoning no longer serve us and that we have to engage in abductive reasoning or what I would call creative reasoning, that we have to generate new, albeit tentative ways of trying to puzzle in our way through what we're now experiencing. And so that can lead to all sorts of different possibilities. So the first is, again, encountered uncertainty. And then the idea that I like to really explore and have been explored in my work, in addition to encountered uncertainty is invited uncertainty or induced uncertainty and this is where we are kind of um, designing uncertainty into otherwise planned um, learning and living experiences. And we can do this when we want to try to improve um, our experience, when we want to change things, when we want to engage in some sort of aesthetic or creative form of expression. So, I want to also highlight this idea that not all experiences with uncertainty can motivate 
new ways of thinking or acting. And Dewey talks about this as well. And I just kind of put these labels on here. So there are some mundane uncertainties that we encounter all the time. I mean, things that we have doubts about, but you know, they're not, they don't rise to the level of our consciousness. You know, they often go by without much notice or response. Um, just because they're not really kind of perturbing um, <laughs> us enough, essentially. And then there's profound uncertainties, which perhaps do cause us a lot of angst and anxiety and fear and concern, but they strike us as almost completely unknowable. Um, and it, we just learn to kind of somehow coexist with these as there's little we can do to resolve them. And again, these aren't fixed cap categories. I would see these as kind of effervescent categories that bubble up and down um, depending on you know time space the situation and then so it's in this space where i've kind of situated my work in this idea of kind of actionable uncertainty and this is a state of doubt that rises to our level of awareness whereby we find ourselves at an impasse but feel the need to explore and feel like we are actually able to explore and enact possibilities so we have some sense of agency here and it might be kind of individual agency or kind of collective agency but for whatever reason, we, we both feel a need and the capacity to take action. And this is where I would argue that we see uh, creative expression. So again, not static categories, these kind of blend together. I tried to illustrate that in my little drawing here um, with the kind of perforated lines and they kind of do blend and bubble and blend together. Um, but they do this kind of level of intensity from kind of low level to very extreme. And so it's again, this kind of liminal space somewhere in between. So two more slides and then we're into conversation. <laughs> so what I've kind of thought about in my own work and started designing and started actually implementing and piloting and studying are these kind of two spaces, what I call encounter and induced uncertainty. And this little circle, I'm not gonna go into too much um, discussion about it. I talked about it in the paper a little bit, this little actionable uncertainty circle that I have here. This is the idea that um, actual uncertainty occurs oftentimes in encountered spaces in the gap between what we expect and what we actually live. Or the way I kind of put it in the paper is this kind of liminal space that we find ourselves in when the expected meets the unexpected or when the planned meets the lived. Um, and this can happen even if you're, if you're working with materials, for example, you know, some folks that speak that work about materials talk about how materials speak back to you. So as you're kind of working with whatever form of material, there's almost an agency that's that voices back to you and resists what you're trying to, what your kind of design idea might be. Or those of you that um, are educators, you know, your lesson plan often when it meets the lesson as lived, there's often um, some pushing back from what's actually happening in that space with other folks involved in that space and other kind of material social features that kind of emerge. So this gap is what um, Dewey talks about is this is we should suspend our desire to quickly conclude this, right? This is where we should kind of engage with it, suspend it, because it is here that we can explore new possibilities um, for thought and action, which may help us temporarily resolve the uncertainty we're experiencing um, by finding some new way of thinking or acting. And again, the key word here is temporary because this is always at play. Uncertainty is always um, and already at play in any kind of lived encounter. And then the other end of this kind of space is kind of induced uncertainty. So I've been playing with this kind of blend of how can we as educators blend kind of predetermined elements when, when we design learning experiences or design any kind of experience, any kind of designer. So uncertainty by design where we kind of figure out like what are the features that provide enough structure and support so it doesn't become overwhelming for the folks that we're designing these experiences for, but we leave enough to be determined elements that allows for new possibilities to emerge. So this kind of blend between, and I talk a little bit at length in the paper and, and, a, and a lot in my other work about this idea of if we're designing learning experiences, the prototypical learning experience is all the elements of a task are predetermined. We often give uh, young people or the folks we're working with a predetermined problem. We teach them a predetermined process for solving that problem. We have predetermined criteria for determining whether you're successful. And then we have a predetermined product that we're looking for. And so we kind of try to engineer out uncertainty, even though that's not entirely possible, but it does tend to stifle or at least signify that uncertainty is something that needs to be engineered, designed, planned out of experiences. 
So I've been working with educators to try to unplan their lessons by kind of opening up some elements. So maybe you teach them this top row and then maybe you open up and say, I'm gonna show you one problem, but now you need to come up with your own problems using the same predetermined process, using the same criteria, and ultimately driving towards this more complex um, experience with uncertainty. And it's complex because it has more pre or to be determined elements where we allow young people to identify problems that matter to them um, find ways to solve those by partnering with outside experts or members of their community um, and represent their understanding by producing their own product. And that our job still is kind of to help them understand what the criteria are, how they can find help, um, you know, what materials they have, how much time they have. So that kind of changes our role and kind of gets to this more extreme, um, but I think uh, generative blend of uncertainty and predetermined criteria. Okay, so I've spoken quickly and I've covered a lot of ideas. What I'd like to now do is stop sharing my screen unless you wanna see it again. And let's open it up to some conversation. Thank you so much, Ron. This was enormously insightful and thank you for squeezing in so much. I took so many notes, I, I, I wouldn't know where to begin and that's why I think I'm gonna let Wendy begin. <laughs> We didn't, we didn't talk much about this. Thank you. Throw me to the lions. And, uh, I, I also took loads of notes. I also took loads of notes. Um, but if you want Wendy, so Wendy is our colleague from Kingston University and involved in the Serendipity Society. She's our partner for the Creativity Week. Would you like to, to throw in the, the first question, Wendy? Um, yeah, well, I was interested um, in the levels. I think we, we spoke already about the levels of different uncertainty. And one of the things that struck me was this idea that at the moment, we're living in a time where we actually don't have very, we have a lot of uncertainty that we're aware of, but it's not, it's not actionable. And you see people trying desperately hard to do something, but actually what we have to do is, is, is nothing essentially. And that's the only way we can resolve some of these uncertainties. So that real profound uncertainty is coming through our lives. Um, is it possible to be in a state where there's no actionable uncertainty? I mean, how do you, how do you see that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really interesting question. And I guess the way I've been kind of conceptualizing this is um, viewing uncertainty as this kind of um, phenomenological judgment or read, um, which certainly can be kind of a collective read. I think we're certainly influenced by the way other folks are, are seeing and experiencing and describing their encounters with uncertainty. But yes, I think people can feel very immobilized by um, you know, what they can consider unactionable uncertainty. And I think that's where you see a lot of perhaps despair or you see people trying to um, be agents of their own lives in different ways, maybe kind of resisting it. Um, so, I mean, you, you see like, for example, in the States now, we're seeing now big numbers of, you know, COVID again, because people, you know, it was described in the news just in my own state here as people returning to pre-pandemic behaviors. So it's almost like it's so overwhelming that it becomes ignored, perhaps to your own peril, right? So this is where I think, um, you know, what do we do with this discomfort? How do we kind of make sense of it? How do we navigate it? How do we engage with it? How can others help us kind of conceptualize that? Because again, I think it's dynamic. I think just because, you know, somebody experiences something as um, beyond, you know, prof too profound to actually even conceptualize or act on in one moment can at turns at the next moment feel like, okay, I think I can do something here. And then at turns again, feel, um, you know, stifled. And I think if we talk about this in a kind of a, a pedagogical context, I think this is where educators can, can learn how to kind of step in and step out and provide those kinds of supports. Because I think if we're, particularly if we're trying to design an experience, which I'm interested in, to try to help people develop their stamina, their confidence, and their competence in navigating what seems perhaps at first blush inactionable. Um, how do we do that so people don't just recoil from it? And I think young people tend to do this. I mean, school is so, uh, young people's experiences are so overplanned, so overdesigned, so overwrought that they are immobilized. When I, before I came to the Arizona State University, I directed this. Um, innovation house at the University of Connecticut. So it was all majors coming in, undergraduate students. Um, so they were, some were undeclared, some were engineers, some were um, in the design, some were in the arts, they were all over the map. Uh, but they all self-selected into innovation. They wanted to learn about innovation. They wanted to be innovators. 
They lived in the dormitory. I mean, it was a house, innovation house. They lived there. Our classroom was below where they lived. We had a huge maker space, all those different things. Um, and so I started with what, what are some of the problems that you see as problems that maybe nobody else sees that you want to address? And many of them, that was too profound of, an, of a statement, uncertain a statement for them because their identity and prior learning trajectory as a student has been to do what's expected and how it's expected. That's what the game of school is about. And they could even figure that out if things were obscure, but they couldn't figure that out. They didn't, first of all, some of them didn't trust that I was saying that. They're like, well, what kinds of problems should we do? I see, whatever problem, this is your chance, right? This is your chance. You said you want to be an innovator, not a spectator. This is your problem, right? So some of them didn't trust that. Some of them had no experience with that in this space called school or in educational, formal educational spaces. So it was far too overwhelming. So what we realized, my graduate student team and I realized is we have to slow down and we have to provide perhaps a little bit more structure and give them some examples of problems that students have worked on before. But again, try to help them not just pick those up and to kind of take big steps towards engaging with uncertainty. So I think part of that question is, um, what role can we play to help people navigate it, to help people structure their uncertainty a little bit so it doesn't become too chaotic, too overwhelming? And I, I, I think I'm thinking a lot about um, the I do a lot of work with um, with scouts. So I'm thinking about that similar thing of um, yeah of, of taking taking them somewhere and and getting to the stage where eventually by the time they're 14 you send them off on their own. But you couldn't just send them off on their own in the wilderness with a backpack and say off you go. It's it's taking well you could it depends on my child I'd quite like to sometimes, but essentially you can't. It's, it's, that's how you scaffold to allow them, but also without taking up all the in, taking away all the power, right? Because then when you encounter true uncertainty, you wouldn't know what to do with it. Yes. Um, another question I had because it ties in with some of the conversations we've been having in the um, Serendipity Society over the past week or so. Um, where we've been talking about reduced um, reduced chart opportunities for serendipity uh, as everything's moved online. So you no longer have those um, moments of co co corridor conversations, for example. You no longer talk to each other outside of meetings, you just have the meetings and there's a split second silence when everyone searches for the exit the chat room and doesn't quite make eye contact with each other because you don't really know what to do. And um, similar with dating apps and things like that. And I wondered what you thought about how you can how if everything becomes more online, how we can still keep that uncertainty, which seems fundamentally important for some of the serendipitous encounters that we talk about. Yeah, um, I, and I mean, I would really try to resist um, everything <laughs> going to online. I think it's it's one of those, again, I think it was a quick and perhaps necessary move, um, but I don't think people have sat with it or not, the uncertainty that we're facing and what it means for um, educational spaces and serendipitous moments and so on. And so I think if what I like to do is, is think about technology as a tool that can help support or mediate learning, but not become the vehicle. I think if it becomes the vehicle, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of it a little bit. So what I think is really interesting, if we look about our spaces, so we're kind of looking through this kind of vehicle right now, but in the meantime, you know, my family members are doing different things, right? Work and play and rest simultaneously. And there's these serendipitous moments that are happening in this new configuration of, you know, my daughter seeing both my wife and myself work and get a kind of pull back the curtain on that and just parallel she's learning and, and sometimes those cross over. Um, and so there's these new moments. And then there's all these uncertainties about these spaces that are perhaps um, no longer able to sustain themselves like restaurants, right? So what if, um, I think there's, there's great importance in the physicality of space, the materiality of space when it comes to learning and creativity and so on. So what if we were able to find new ways to engage those spaces, perhaps using technology, not, not abandoning technology, but still use the physicality of space. So even though we're all kind of remotely connected, there are things we could do still in this kind of material space here. And so I was giving a talk for the Lego Foundation Idea Conference early in the spring, right when COVID kind of shut things down. And part of our plan during the actual presentation was to work with, you know, I mean, it's Lego, so we're gonna work with the bricks and so on. So, but 
we didn't abandon that during the kind of virtual presentation. We actually invited people to use whatever kind of material objects they had. And there were two of us speaking and we, we were playing and using these objects to kind of as stimuli. So we were still engaged with the materiality around us, even though we were just kind of using this kind of vehicle of technology to kind of demonstrate it or show it or communicate it. So I would, I would, I'd raise great caution of trying to put everything digital, trying to use digital tools, um, which can be great, but think about how can we continue the material spaces? How can we think of those as third spaces? I think that's where creativity and serendipity really occurs. You mentioned it's in the hallway, right? I think we need to step out of our typical spaces, like a school or home, and find a third space, like a restaurant that's no longer serving food to patrons, but perhaps still has relationships with farmers, and now it can be this kind of um, farm-to-table learning environment, right? Who knows what can, these can be repurposed. I think we could think much differently about physicality, materiality, and technology, but I, I really am concerned about using it as the primary and sole vehicle, um, as brilliant as it often is, for learning, communication, and experiencing each other, right? And serendipity and creativity and so on. Yeah, no, I, I I feel very similar, um, and and it's interesting as well that um, I, I don't think you were at the start, but Juliana talked about um, creating those Getty. I, I love the Getty, you know, the Getty challenge of recreating the artwork, and she was she was moving her teaching online, and she was getting people to recreate the artwork using the things they have in their house. Yeah, so even yeah. though it was digital, it was still, as you said, this this sort of rooted in materiality and rooted in something that's right. Yeah, um, I think I've almost had my time, Vlad. Oh, you yield your time. I have, I have a zillion <laughs> questions, so I can keep going forever. I can, I can actually well, stop the can, That's not a problem for me. We can come back to them. Let's see. Also, we'll we'll have some time for questions from the audience. But I, I want to thank you again, Ron. I I want to start with a question. It's kind of a bit of a devil's advocate question, and I love asking this because this is what I am asked myself. Okay, and you know that I have a, a passion for wonder, which is really in the vicinity of, of uncertainty. We can discuss maybe a bit later what what might be the difference between wonder and um, uncertainty. But this question comes from uh, I recently read. I came across a book. I don't know if you know about it. It's called Mer Merchants of Doubt. Merchants of Doubt. And the, the subtitle is how a handful of scientists obscured the truth on issues from tobacco smoke to global warming. So this is a book about how doubt is used by some groups, obviously not everywhere, to actually undermine confidence in science, right? So uh, this is a question that comes back to me again and again. You know, what we tend to present a lot of phenomena we work on as, as intrinsically positive, or at least, uh, you know, mostly positive. What, what are your thoughts about the limitations or the, the dark sides of doubt and uncertainty? One of them was obviously yeah. being, being stuck. And I really like your, your typology. And obviously, you know, we don't want to push people into existential doubt that might lead to, but what do you think about this, this other angle? You know, any dark sides to, to doubting? Yeah, I love that. I love that idea. I think there's a lot of different ways of kind of thinking about this. And I think one is perhaps this orientation uh, toward doubt that is that the pragmatists talk about, like that Peirce talks about. So the idea that you are still going to ultimately try to resolve it in a kind of reasonable way, but you're maintaining, I think you're maintaining this kind of healthy skepticism, if you will, that mm -hmm. You're not trying to go from one dogmatic position to the next, <laughs> right? That, that if you if you you know had such a fixed view and that gets disrupted, then you must abandon that entirely and try to find some other fixed, stable island to stand on and hoping that it will never crumble again. I think if you learn to live with doubt and uncertainty, you always do, even though you do ultimately take a position and a stand. Um, that you recognize that it's it's somewhat tenuous, um, and, and it can become more robust and thickened, um, and you can develop habits and routines and so on. But I think what you can reflect on, I think this is where you know having this kind of triple temporal orientation, where you're constantly at play with your past, present, and future, right? That you can recognize that in your own past, the way you think about it now you know, has changed. The, the experiences you've had with doubt and uncertainty should always serve as kind of this um, pebble in your confident shoe <laughs> that, you know, perhaps there is a problem, but, you know, if you kind of look at the alternatives, this seems to be the most reasonable. 
So what mm. Hearst talks about, for example, is it's not chance, blind chance that we come to resolve something. And he talked a lot about science, right? Scientific ideas. It's not blind chance. Those are funded. They're funded by our experiences, by um, testing those things out, by our reason, right? So kind of deductively reasoning through these, inductively, e experimentally testing them out. And they, they, they are funded by this body of knowledge that they seem to be the most reasonable given um, the other alternatives. And right, and so, but you can never say that it's gonna be conclusive, right? That, that, that there's always gonna be doubt at play. So that would be one way to kind of um, respond to that. But I think it, it is potential. I think it can lead to um, a concept that I've been kind of playing around with is this idea, especially, particularly when I speak with educators and educational leaders is this notion of, um, the resistance they have to creativity, let alone uncertainty. Uncertainty is terrifying because I think it does, it, it is, it challenges your identity. What kind of teacher would I be if I don't know where this lesson is going to go? What kind of educational leader would I be if I don't know where I'm, you know, taking this school or this district or whatever, um, and or this policy? So I think the idea that you're letting that go, and then what I hear the resistance from is creativity is so uncertain that I don't think we could do it. And so people become, if there's too much doubt, they become prisoners of their own imagination. They still engage in possibility thinking, but the possibilities are so terrifying <laughs> that they're immobilized again, right? So I think there's great danger in becoming a prisoner in your own imagination, whether it immobilizes you or whether it um, pushes you into these kind of untenable, dangerous beliefs that could harm not only yourself, but others. So I think we have to be on guard ourselves and also in our conversations. And this is where others come into play. These dialogues that we have internally and externally with other folks that we want to make sure that we have these different perspectives. That's maintaining this liminal difference. That's maintaining that that's saying, well, there, perhaps there is a different way, a better way of doing this. You know, perhaps you shouldn't drink um, detergents to try to. <laughs> <laughs> Stop COVID, as some people suggest, right? So, I think there are these interesting productive tensions that could be healthy and cultivated as well. I don't know if that if that helps. Um, no, absolutely, I love the the metaphor of pebble in your in your shoe, because it it's I I can see how one way of looking at it definitely is that not each and every doubt will necessarily be equally productive. And of course, we need to to see this phenomenon within. I think that book. I I I'm still to read it really, but I, I came across the the topic and I'm, I'm interested in it, uh, it makes us situated within society and within a certain history and within different projects of different communities because any act of wonder or doubting or uncertainty is not just a, an act of, of an individual person. But I like this idea that it's almost, I wouldn't say a mindset, it, it's a very low determined psychology, but it's an orientation towards life that you have to keep this healthy skepticism, as you say, and just to to kind of uh, add add a little bit to that, I think the history of wonder has uh, has these beautiful examples of how Socrates, who obviously proposed the whole idea of doubting and, and being uncertain about things as a virtue, he was meant to drink poison precisely because he was corrupting the mind of the young who would allegedly become um, stuck you know that's the whole thing we're talking about they wouldn't know anymore what to do and uh, and and he found ways actually to go to go beside that and and then anyway it's a very long very long story but it reminds me of heidegger as well and the accusation of he worked on wonder and he didn't see the horrors of the nazi regime around and and anna Arendt picked up on this question does wonder makes us politically inept and inactive and she said no actually this dose of healthy skepticism that that uh, makes you wonder, and it's a it's a it's a great asset for a democratic society actually to be able to always question yourself. So I think there is a long history, but I I, I like this uh, yeah your your angle onto it. I'm gonna have just a second quick quick question, and then I want to open it up to more because I'm I'm interested in education and uh, this notion of genuine doubt is very beautiful and and really profound for me. Because I'm, I'm thinking of the opposite of doubt that is not truly genuine. And I think that a lot of teachers, not all of them, we, we don't point fingers at anyone, but they use doubt and surprise in the classroom in a way that is still very controlled. So in the self-other relation, who experiences doubt and how? You basically engineer doubt in the other, but you don't do it you know, within yourself. So you said you, you, you work also with teachers. How do you see this way of 
of unstructuring classrooms, where do we start? We start with the teacher, with the student. Obviously, there, is there a methodology that you've, you've kind of established there? Yes, um, yeah, I've done it. And I've also tried to do this in trying to create conditions for creative expression, kind of a research um, component as well. So the idea, starting with teachers, is teachers learn how to plan, and again, like I mentioned, over plan learning experiences. Because, you know, because it becomes this binary that if it's not planned, it's going to be chaos. And people that have taught have experienced chaos, and it's not pleasant, and nobody likes it, and it's not productive. So, but again, if, I think we need to kind of nuance that a bit. So what I usually do, the way I start, my kind of methodology, if you will, um, but I'm not the kind of doctor that gives out prescriptions, so I'm very careful about that. So my general heuristic, I guess, would be, I usually have educators bring a lesson that they've planned that they feel their students um, resist or they themselves no longer like or don't feel as effective, but they're still using it for whatever reason, or perhaps something that they're going to be teaching that they plan. So we start with what's already planned out, and then we start looking at those and, and we use kind of a group possibility thinking, if you will, and we start looking at the elements of that. So I usually have, you know, this little heuristic again, that's not necessarily prescriptive, but if we look at a lesson or an activity, you could say there's usually a task to be completed. There's usually a procedure for accomplishing that task. There's usually an outcome or product, and then there's some criteria. And so let's look at this and see where are the places where we can maybe remove some of the overwrought, over-engineered aspects of this and really introduce some uncertainty while still maintaining the structure of criteria and support. So I think the key is to message to educators that you still play a critical role in providing a structured and supportive learning environment. You still have to be kind of nimble in knowing when to provide structure to something maybe you unstructured and maybe unstructured something that you overstructured. And this may vary on an individual basis, working with certain young people, or it may work with the whole group. But to start with that. And so we start looking at that and saying, okay, what are you doing? And what have, what have you prepared for students that they could probably do on their own? And so maybe it's identify a way of, of approaching this task. And so we open that up. And so that actually introduces genuine uncertainty or genuine doubt because you truly don't know when you do that, how the students are going to respond to that. But you have the criteria to check it against, you're there to provide support. So, yes, it's um, and and kind of person, you know, kind of that was his kind of resistance about Descartes was the idea that Descartes was using these paper doubts, these kind of philosophical doubts and purse is like genuine. You can't create genuine surprise or doubt in your mind. Essentially, I mean, you might be able. I, I don't I'm not that extreme, but the idea that you can just have these kind of philosophical doubts and then write all these things. That's not where new ideas come from. It comes from where you really are at an impact. And so I think, or you really don't know how things are going to, to play out. And so I think we want to do that in kind of a structured way. So it's kind of this two level thing. Working with teachers is something that they're going to have to introduce to their students. They're going to have to provide support and structure in walking their students into uncertainty. And when we're working with educators, we have to provide support and structure in walking them into thinking about how to do that in their own classrooms. So it's this kind of two level thing. And then I think ourselves, we have to be willing to do that as well. Right, so um, I think it's it's better to do that kind of thing instead of have these. I, I I tend not to like powerpoints and so on. I know people always want them, but I like having that as well. I like getting to the Q and A because that's kind of a structured uncertainty. We I mean we have a common thing we've talked about, but who knows what questions are going to be asked or even how I'm going to respond to them. So I think we we have to walk the talk as well, even in these kind of formalized um, spaces of talks and so on. It's a very good example, and I think we should just do it. We should jump into a handful of questions if Wendy agrees as well. I, I see on the chat um, line that Gerard, Bernard, and, and Juliana also put in some thoughts, but I think it's a good moment if, if you want to unmute yourself and um, and ask Ron a question or verbalize your comment, whoever wants to, to start. Otherwise, we, we go back to Wendy's thousand questions. I think <laughs> you said you have many, many more. <laughs> But who, who would like to ask or, or bring any remarks to what you've heard? Yeah, we have Gerard who... who uh... Yes, hi, hi everyone. Uh, thank you everyone for this event. Uh, just uh, quickly, I sent this 
question or comment to both to also Wendy and Vlad and Ron. So uh, I saw the action the uncertainty figure, and my immediate question was: Could we switch between the induced side and encountered side the possibilities and the expectations? Thank you, Gerard. Yes, I love that question. Yeah, I think all those things. So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna share that really quick, just to kind of reorient folks, if I can. Do this nimbly here. Let me see if I can. So I think this is the the slide, right? That Gerard was talking about, right? So, yeah, I agree. I think um, that's the problem with these. Once you put something on paper like this, it seems fixed. When it's much more dynamic at, at, in play, for 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 sure. So. I think when we try to induce certain things, there are going to be encounters that, you know, uncertainties can continually emerge in these kind of uncertain things. So the things that we thought were kind of predetermined, um, we might need to open up a little bit. And the things that we thought were going to be kind of open and fluid, we might need to structure in the moment. So there are these kind of dynamic um, experiences and decisions and that when everyone's at play and everything's at play, that these things can certainly flip back and forth um, and they're not as, you know, they're not separate paths or somehow incommensurate, that they are kind of at play. So that would be the way I um, would respond to that. What do you think, Vlad and Wendy? Wendy? Yeah, you're, you're muted. I was totally muted then, and it's not very often I'm muted. So Vlad, you definitely have to go. No, I, I, I agree with this idea of, uh, of how we stabilize, I mean, from the beginning, you know, things within one schema, and then it's always useful to, to look at the reverse of that. I, I come back often to the issue of perspectives, really, in a situation, you know, I mean, it goes back in psychology to the actor-observer differences and for whom it is of a certain kind. And I, and I think in, in what you said, Ron, about the, the way you would work with the teachers, it's very useful to, to present to them this very perspectival way of also looking at, at doubts and the experience of doubt uh, in self, in others, and the way these things articulate. That, that was my reflection when I was thinking about this reversal of expectations, who holds expectations uh, in this situation. Um, Wendy, do you, do you have anything? And it's, and it's, hard, it's hard as well to model any of these things on a, on a flat 2D surface, isn't it? I think, I think that's, that, that, that's part of the problem and it's part of when you're trying to measure something which is dynamic and constantly shifting and, and uncertain, trying to create some sort of model that will, that, that will enable us to express that, but also keep that dynamism is super hard. And, and I think the circle that it's kind of there that helps to do that, but it's yeah, you're 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 stuck really with the tools that you have, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the best way to do that is to actually design an experience that that illustrates that. And so what I've I've tended to do in like workshops, both research based and kind of pedagogically based, is design kind of a a structured activity that has uncertainty in it, um, mm -hmm. and then. To illustrate how dynamic all of this is, to, to take these kind of momentary measures of people's confidence, just their general confidence in, in doing creative work and navigating uncertain problems and solving problems, and what their emotional state is, for example, and then present the problem, see how does that change, just kind of take note of that. And then like at these moment momentary intervals, just kind of do that. And then what becomes the kind of interesting conversation is looking at your own profiles and other people's profiles and seeing how your confidence, your emotional state, all these things are dynamic within your own experience and across other people's experiences and talk about what, what helped kind of stabilize that, if it did, what were these different kind of encounters? And I think what that helps people do is kind of flip between because I just want to kind of bring this point up again, kind of Gerard's point, kind of it, it just kind of popped into my mind that I think there is this belief that if we have certainty, then we can take action. The same thing is if there's a there's a parallel belief that is um, we can't take risks unless we've developed trust in this environment, right? Mm -hmm. And I would flip both of those that it's actually doubt and uncertainty that propels us into action. Because if we're, you know, otherwise we can almost be on autopilot. We can almost automatize if we are certain how this plays out. I mean, you could you could use AI to <laughs> make that happen. And, and, in, and in that, then certainty is generated through action. 
So it's not that there's uncertainty in an action, but actually the two come together at the same time. And so sort of the, the resolution of the uncertainty unfolds during the action that you do in order to resolve it. So you kind of cut that process is important, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. And then the thing about taking risks, the best way to build trust is to take risks together. So I think trying to disrupt those two concepts. Um, so let's take some risks together that are going to again be sensible and somewhat structured and let's do that by engaging with uncertainty. And when we do that, then we can see that the uncertainty and the risk taking is actually building a trusting environment and propelling us to new thoughts and action and actually fueling additional uncertainties. And that's how people, I think, can start um, reorienting themselves or developing new perspectives around uncertainty that could be productive um, rather than fearful. Because I think risk and uncertainty <laughs> connote fear and danger and all these things, right? Right. So we have Other a way folks thoughts, yeah. We have a way bigger vocabulary. I, I know that there were other comments, at least on the chat here from Bernard as well, but if anyone wants to pitch in either from this question or with a new comment. Uncertainty also suggests the possibility of opportunity. And I think that's what you're trying to be able to suggest. Unfortunately, um, human beings scatter on a normal curve of comfort with uncertainty. So some people just cling to their fixed belief and they've got to have them. They are so frightened about changing them. And I see that in the study of coincidences, which include synchronicity and serendipity, that people don't want to change their beliefs about how the world works, some of them. Some are just certain God is the answer. And on the other side, there are people who are certain that randomness explains how the universe works. And we're in between here, I think, recognizing that we individuals have something to do with what happens in uncertain conditions. Thank you, Bernard. I think that's that's well put. And, and yeah, I think for sure, and I, I think one of the unintended consequences of kind of overplanned or the, I would say the prototypical school environment or learning environment is that students and educators learn to try to avoid uncertainty and move towards certainty. And so, you know, the, regardless of the interesting ideas or different perspectives that young people have, which is kind of the crux of creativity, it's really about a game of intellectual hide and seek. Guess what the teacher wants to hear and how the teacher wants to hear it. And the teacher makes sure that stepping into that classroom, and I think if we reflect on our own teaching, that we can try to anticipate and have the answer ready at hand for young people, right? And so I think, Part of it is a hard ask or a big ask for folks because it does change our very conception and identity in these roles as educator. Like I mentioned earlier, you know, it's, it seems um, a signifier of incompetence if you don't know what's gonna happen next. And one of the best answers you can give is I don't know. Exactly. And you could even put the dot, 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 but I can show what, here's some ways we can figure it out perhaps, right? Right. Yeah, right. so I think that's part of, that is a, yeah, that would be the beautiful response, um, but that often gets dismissed and so on. So I think part of what my work endeavors to do is disrupt this a bit, to disrupt this kind of prototypical model and provide opportunities for teachers and the students they work with to encounter uncertainty in productive ways and develop their, confidence and confidence and identity around that that okay yeah i did do that and it didn't work out and and so we had to think about things differently or, or the problem i thought was the problem wasn't actually the problem and even so what i do for example what i did at innovation house the end of the year exhibition of learning wasn't just to say this is the company we developed this is the product we generate this is the new you know um service or club we designed or whatever the case would be, because they were all aimed at trying to build something for other folks that could make a positive lasting contribution. Some of those projects were a disaster, but that wasn't what it was about. What it was about is telling the story behind it. So that's when you, when you kind of, again, change the outcome where it's not, you know, this show us the kind of finely rendered paper, but this is what we tried to do. And regardless of whether it worked or not, this is what I learned about myself. This is what I learned about the problem. This is what I would try to do differently. And so that gave openings for students to say at uh, the 11th hour, we were working on this project. 
the entire academic year and decided to abandon it because we found something different, something more interesting. I mean, why can't we do that in school? We assign a term paper and, <laughs> and you have to finish on that topic. Why can't you abandon it right before you have to hand it in and say, I only have a paragraph written on my new paper. I can show you the you know 40 pages I wrote on the other one, but this is what I'm really interested in now because of this, right? I think those, if we can kind of bring out that messiness, but still kind of showcase it as profound learning rather than some kind of finely polished, reified object that we've created. Um, I, I think we could we could start moving in that direction, perhaps. At least that's great idea. Great, great idea. Great idea. Because I think as well, I mean, we see it sometimes in some of the research grants and things that we write. Um, is that if you you almost have to know what the answer is before you even start doing it, in which case it starts to become slightly pointless, doesn't it? When you're having to say, well, this is definitely, we're gonna find out this, this, and this. And then you start, you, the, the process, that process of exploratory research and, and dealing with uncertainty becomes very hard because our system is, is designed to, you, what's the point of starting on anything unless you know it's gonna happen at the end of it? And um, yeah, I think that, that becomes problematic for new ideas, exactly as you've said, that you need also to do it wrong. I also do psychotherapy, and there are times when I am thinking of what's right for the patient, and they say, I, I'm, I think I know what you're thinking, and I say, well, I'm thinking something, but I'm not sure if it's right or not, so I want to hear what you're thinking, and it takes them a while to get used to that. Yeah, that's nice, and I think even, you know, conferences that are meant to kind of share ideas that are kind of in the making or ideas in the rough, if you will, um, still often ask for an abstract, which is, you know, <laughs> problematic, right? The abstract, when I'm writing a paper, that's the last thing I write, because I have no idea, you know, I have some ideas, right? But they change, they morph. If you try to write a paper based on a preformed abstract, you're already sunk. You're already gonna, you know, you're trapped in those ideas. So I think there's a lot of ways we can kind of think about this, the way we kind of, the things we signify about uncertainty and doubt that kind of um, work against its kind of possibility, opportunity, productiveness. It seems to be like the marker of a new paradigm, but but that cuts across so many things in our lives, right? I mean, from education, the way we do conferences, the way we build identity, and all of these uh, kind of connected phenomena, mobilities, letting go, wondering, all, all of them come together and they build this bigger, bigger picture somehow. Um, I'm really enjoying this dialogue. Anyone wants to probably ask a last question at this point? Who wants to have this honor? I hate to be pushy, but I would love to jump in. Is anyone else competing? Please, please do. Samantha. Or Andrea, I see Andrea as well. Did you also, Andrea? Oh, yeah. Maybe we can definitely build. have two okay. questions. I'll, I'll ask quick. I'll try to ask quick. Uh, yeah, so it's something that I'm dealing with actually in the educational context as well, where uh, you're trying to open up a space for play. But I'm working on this in the context of ethics. And it's very hard not to put constraints on the kinds of outcomes <laughs> that you might get in, a, in an ethics context. So I was wondering if uh, if uncertainty is, uh, it, how, how like or different is it from open-mindedness? Um, which is kind of the usual way that people talk about this. You want to be open to possibilities. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. And I, 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 you know, I would need to think about that some more, but I guess on first blush kind of off the cuff here, I would say that there might be a different emotional valence with um, openness. I think openness is kind of an, the way we orient ourselves to things, right? I think it, it might follow from an experience of uncertainty perhaps. But I think uncertainty has this kind of emotional quality to it as well that um, evokes things like fear and discomfort and so on. So I think being open to that as being potentially generative. And I think particularly in education, you know, one of the unwritten rules is there are no negative emotions allowed. <laughs> right. I mean, the minute somebody's getting frustrated or upset, we, we immediately say, oh, no, don't don't be upset. No, calm down. And, you know, it's okay. Why not? Why can't you be angry when you're learning and when you've hit an impasse? I mean, I think if you, we think about our own learning, our own work, there's a lot of frustration. There's a lot of doubt. There's a lot of anger, right? So I think bringing in this emotional balance, right, of setbacks can help us be open. So I, again, if we do these little kinds of activities where we say, 
you know, it's okay to be frustrated, to be angry, to be disappointed, to be embarrassed. Um, and that's a temporary state. So, you know, we, you, that can resolve itself perhaps. And how, what you do with that anger, I mean, it's not okay to kind of hit the child next to you that you're working with. Or something like that. But it's okay to feel angry, to be frustrated, right? So I think those kinds of things can, again, perhaps cultivate this um, orientation towards openness that we become open to a full range of human emotion, a full range of doubts and beliefs and so on that can help us kind of move into new possible states. So, Andrea, you have the honor of the last question. <laughs> well, that's a great honor. Let's see if I, I'm up to it. Okay, so I was thinking particularly about uncertainty in education and um, from a developmental point of view, uh, thinking about children in kindergarten, for example, and thinking about the ones that are on the 12th grade, um, it seems to me that uncertainty is part of the regular day of uh, small children, you know, and even in school, because the, the educator allows them to freely explore the, 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 the room and uh, the space, the educational space they're in. And uh, as, as we evolve, to the, the 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 adolescence and to the youth, they they get more clustered in this time timetables and tasks and all of that, and this is kind of a paradox, right? Because uncertainty for me has a lot to do with complexity too, with uh, psychological complexity, and uh, as we go along our developmental stages, we were supposed to be more complex, so. Do you think that education and the world of education is actually ready to include uncertainty uh, as a really, to me, it is a fundamental question, you know, because it has a lot of um, paradox between what uh, education says that it should be and what education really is. And so I wanted yeah. to hear your insights about this, because I know this is a big question. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea. I, I love that question. There's so much to it. I think you know, I think it's happening. You know, uncertainty happens in those spaces. It's it's whether, yeah, are we ready to kind of engage with it, to 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 work with it, to invite it, to um, kind of rethink it. Um, and I love your idea of how you know young kids enter this place called school with so much. And so this is where brings you know kind of Vlad's work too on wonder. So curiosity, wonder, doubt, right? All these different things are at play. Um, and then you enter this, this space that becomes very certain. There's so many certainties. I think that's what that's kind of a hidden thing that's taught in these formal spaces is certainty. And then anything that could actually disrupt that certainty and cause doubt, like trying out what you were taught in a meaningful way, is actually deferred until some later date. I call it the educational promissory note. So you're taught something and it's like, well, when can we use this? Well, you know, someday you can use this. You'll, you'll need this when you go on to, you know, from primary to, you know, secondary school or, you know, go on to uni or whatever the case may be, or the world of work. So everything gets deferred later so that you're living in this kind of really kind of artificially construed, highly certain, highly designed, overwrought space where it does minimize the complexity for everyone involved, um, which is somewhat understandable given the, the amount of difference that's in there. But because difference drives creativity, is actually engineering out a lot of opportunities for creative expression new possibilities and the ability to feel like you have agency in the midst of intense complexity and uncertainty which is what we enter the world with and and, and you know it's always an already present so it is a, an interesting paradox that we create this overly engineered some artificial sense of confidence and certainty um that and I think that's why people have a lot of satisfaction with what is being taught. So who knows? I think people, I think what's happening in the world are causing people to hopefully step back and pause and think, can we think about what we've been doing a little bit differently? That'd be my hope. Mm -hmm. We are in a state of genuine doubt. I hope you all embrace it. Thank you all for having me <laughs> join you We're right at that Thank time. so much, Ron. I, I, I think this may beautiful frame kind of to the whole event, including the hour before your talk, we're talking about crisis as an opportunity. And I think you you pointedly kind of like the, the last remark addressed that. Uh, when did you have any any final comment or thoughts? Unmuted? <laughs> I have to 
to artificially mute myself it's the easiest way to keep me quiet um i just want to say thank you very much that was that was really, really interesting having um having read your um chapter um and our hearings so we having the chance to explore the idea so i just wanted to thank you for coming along and for, thank um, you yeah doing our keynote for our week hey vlad <laughs> Thank you very much, Ron, and then thank you, Wendy. And one good thing about postponing the Creativity Week is that the weather is really dreadful outside, and we deserve a better June next year. And I really hope, Ron, you're going to join us. I'm going to read you, give you a bit of an applause because I can't really you know, take myself out of this embodied uh, aspect of presenting. And thank good, you. For good. The we're going to post this talk, and um, I guess we're going to let you know, Ron, and if there are any links or things you want us to add, we'll we'll definitely do that. Thank you all, and thank you so much. Hope to see you back with other online events and definitely at the Creativity Week next year. See you all Thank next you. year. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.